Hi, everybody. Welcome back once again. This is Mark Lawrence, along with our cast of experts here on the Against the Spread show. And we're all set to go against the spread with our NFL previews as they continue this week. This week, we're going to take in the AFC South and the AFC West divisions. With that, I want to welcome our past, our panel of experts, I should say. Andy Isco joining us from TheLogicalApproach.com. Jim Feist joining us from Las Vegas, the legend himself. Tony Mejia from Florida, a neighbor of ours and Victor's and I. Victor King from King Creole Sports and publisher of the Total Tip Sheet. And Greg De Palma, our producer <coughs> extraordinaire, all to the show. And guys, with that, it's time. Like I said, we're going to be previewing these AFC and NFC divisions, the very popular segment, popular, well-received portion of the podcast when we do these NFL previews. We're going to tear down, strip down the AFC South and the AFC <coughs> West. And this is being brought to you, as I mentioned before, by the Playbook Football Preview Guide magazine. They're literally flying off the shelves. They're going out of our office in record numbers as we're speaking here. Uh, if you want to have a print copy in your hand, I encourage you to log on at playbooksports.com or call the office toll-free at 1-800-PLAYBOOK to reserve your print copy. They'll ship it by way of priority mail, or you can get a PDF version of it. You can also order that in the store, and also you can get it free here on the show. All you need to do is fill out a comment section down below on the site here. Send us a comment, and we will send you a free PDF version of the 2024 Playbook Football Preview Guide magazine. And guys, as I asked you before in the past, uh, I know there's ways that we all prepare for sports. And uh, before I, we even get into this division here, let me ask you guys, Andy, is there any specific way you prepare for the National Football League? Do you do it by divisions, or do you do it by a whole, or by a league, or a conference? I do it almost a combination of all. I look at each team, and I determine – Compared to last year, uh, do I perceive them to be better, weaker? Was their record, was their win-loss record reflective of how well they played? And then I do it for all 32 teams, and then I look within the divisions, and I'll make some adjustments because maybe I have one division rated a little bit too highly and another rated perhaps a little bit too lowly. And then, of course, I take a look at the odds for the conferences and the divisions and see am I way out of uh, whack as far as ranking the teams. So I'll rank the teams from 1 to 32, but also I'll rank the teams within the conferences and within the uh, divisions see how my rankings uh, rate uh, or relate to the odds makers rankings for uh, the, uh, the divisions, the conferences, the will or won't make playoffs and the Super Bowl. So I sort of use a combination of all three. And as I'm doing that, sometimes I'll see a factor that I, I they say, wow, it applies to this team. So, for example, I'll just throw a, uh, an interesting situation out there. The Houston Texans, the remarkable season they had last year with D'Amico Ryan and C.J. Stroud, rookie head coach and rookie quarterback. Here's a team that was not expected to do much, and they showed great improvement last year. So the concern I have or the challenge or the question I have, we often know teams take a little bit of a regression from uh, a tremendous overachievement in one year to the following year when all of a sudden everybody's on that team because they saw the progress they made. Well, is that going to be true or are there reasons perhaps why maybe that won't apply to the Houston Texans? So I'll look a little bit more deeply into their history. Find out, for example, that, uh, you know, uh, Ryan was their third coach in three years after Bill O'Brien was let go. But during the Bill O'Brien regime, the Texans were a playoff team for many years. So maybe what was happening uh, now, obviously, Deshaun Watson being you know no longer the quarterback for the last few years had a lot to do with it. But you're looking at a team that had a lot of playoff experience and maybe just suffered from some poor coaching the last few years with still a talent base in there. So my instinctive reaction is they've got to regress. But upon closer inspection and what I perceive to be the depth and quality of the other teams of the division, that may not necessarily be the case. So I'll balance some unusual situations with what the, what the I'll call it medium-term history, not just the last year or two, but maybe the last four or five years to see if, it's, if, if last year was an aberration or was it a sign of great improvement that should continue or a decline that should also uh, continue. Jim Feist, savvy veteran, longtime veteran in Las Vegas, actually a legend in Las Vegas, and Jim specializes in the NFL. Jim, we asked you last week about your approach to the National Football League. Is there anything one specifically that, uh, that you zero in on first when it comes to preparing for the new season? It's pretty much always the same thing, Mark. Uh, I look at the coaching. 
I st- it starts with the coaching. It starts with their pedigree. It starts with their their history. And when you look at, for example, the AFC West, which we're going to talk about, we got the Chargers with a very excellent coach. You got the Raiders with a very questionable situation there when their coach and their quarterback. You got the Chiefs, of course. We all know who the Chiefs are going for a three peat with an excellent coach, excellent defensive co- coordinator, excellent quarterback, a lot of excellence on that team. And you got the Broncos, kind of a bit of a mess with the quarterback thing, new coach coming in there, didn't work out too well with Russell Wilson. So when I look at those four teams, you know, I come down to the very simple thing. I got the best coach, best quarterback, best defensive coordinator, and they're stable. Now, are they going to be as hungry? I think they're going to be as hungry. Um, the Chargers, you've got Jim, Jim Harbaugh, who's an absolutely fantastic head coach. He's been great everywhere he's gone. he got a little bit of a Herbert injury right now. He's sitting out for a few weeks. The Broncos and Raiders, I see nothing from those two teams. I just don't see anywhere they're going. So when I look at these divisions, I try to figure out, A, who's going to win the division and get into the playoffs? Because the, the real payoff is in the playoffs. Uh, all these guys get paid good money. They all want to ring, win the ring. They all want to hold up the trophy on Super Bowl day. So I start with the coaching. And then I look from the coaching to the assistant coach, the head coach, assistant coaches, quarterback. And then I look at the offensive line. That's how I evaluate teams from the beginning to the end. And it, and it, and it works. Now it's every division. Isn't going to be the same because you'll go to another division that has four teams that are very like, for example, the Cleveland Browns, the Pittsburgh Steelers, the Ravens, the Bengals. Now you've got a different problem. You've got four teams that can all win it. Now we have to figure it, pick it apart. Now, if you remember, too, we're doing long-term projections, but we're also betting on a weekly basis. So, uh, you know, these teams that are good are going to be laying points. The question is, are they good against laying points? Are they good on the road? They're good at home. They're good off back-to-backs with the trap. All that things go into it, but it always starts with the coaching. It always starts with who's the pet, who's got the pedigree of coaching because it all starts there. And we talked about Houston and have a couple of bad years. Maybe they had some bad coaching. I think there's a lot of bad coaching. The Chargers had terrible coaching. Great talent, but terrible coaching. Staley was awful. And, you know, so it starts with the coaching. Well, I agree 100%, uh, Jim. I second that emotion. Uh, I'm really, really deep into the coaches. We keep a database in all the NFL coaches. And I'll say this, that our database about amongst the coaches, you don't find a lot of long, lengthy records or uh, terms of uh, service uh, by coaches because they have to win to stay there. If they lose, they're gone. They're done. And uh, so we do have a few exceptions, though. you got the Mike Tomlins and the Andy Reeds and so forth and whatnot. And I do like the way those into almost every equation when it comes to handicapping the NFL. Victor, when you approach this season here, I know you do things largely from an over-under totals aspect. How are you approaching it from an over-under totals aspect to begin the year? Mark, you mentioned uh, database. And for me, that's always going to be first and foremost. This is something I learned from a uh, pretty smart guy here about 20 years ago and <laughs> definitely stuck to that plan in terms of a database. Uh Make sure you have an accurate and updated database at your fingertips, or at least follow a handicapper that does. And don't be afraid to think outside the box when querying that database. I get a couple of questions almost on a weekly basis, what people think about the, about the 2020 NFL season. And if it's up to me, that's the COVID season. That is an outlier season. And again, if it was up to me, I would consider removing all statistics from the 2020 season from my database to get a little bit more accurate results. Now, I say that because you remember that season, don't you? There was no fans in the stands. There was daily COVID testing. People put on the COVID list and taken off on a daily basis. Games rescheduled. Nothing about that season was your typical NFL season. So if it were up to me, and I've done that with some of my queries in the totals tip sheet is I don't count that as a true NFL season. 
But again, it's all up in the database, and that's what a smart guy taught me a long time ago. Well, I wouldn't disagree with you, Victor. It's sort of like the replacement games when they had went on strike. You know, how much value do you put into replacement teams and records and so forth and whatnot? And I know a lot of sharp handicappers who will also void those seasons out is there as a, well. Is there a number below zero that you could put importance on <laughs> in those replacement games? <laughs> yeah, the, t- the temperature in Cleveland in the winter, below zero. Yeah, right. There you go. <laughs> I, I don't even have those games in my database, although I did a little research. I think it was in that 87 strike season. If you eliminated the three replacement games that they played, the standings would have still had the same teams in the playoffs. There you go. And same Good division point. winners. Good point. Tony Mejia. How are you going about attacking this season here? I know you do a lot of writing for the sporting news, but some really, really great insight. I know you pick up a lot of uh, what we would call like insider information doing just that. Your approach coming into this NFL 2024 season. Well, I'm, I'm still in Olympic mode, Mark. I, got, I broke down Nigeria and the United States who are playing right now as we tape this. And then I'm working on, which I'm done now, I'm just proofreading it, uh, United States, Serbia, uh, semi uh, quarterfinal matchup so that's where my attention is but then I watched the Hall of Fame game until it was rained out and I was very thankful that uh, we had uh, no action on that game because we, uh, we, we Tony we must have been on the, the under he must have yeah. been we on, were the on the under baby. We, did not, we did not appreciate by the way the first, that's a uh, whole different uh, discussion when a game goes over it can never again go under why shouldn't you get paid? I can understand not paying off on, you know, an under when it's canceled because had they played it, they could always, it could go over. But a game, once it's over, can never go back under. I'm with you. Andy was on the over, apparently. We were, no, I, I, was on the over I didn't too, do anything yeah. with the game. We, no, we appreciated the 55-minute rule there. But, yeah, no yeah. question, you have a good point uh, in terms of that. I, I guess they paid out uh, only first-half stuff. Probably, but, yeah. You know, bottom line, uh, I, I played attendances in preseason with – with uh, coaches that want to win, uh, you know, roster dynamic and and uh, and what whatnot, but that's a completely different animal for for the, what we're talking about and discussing previewing an NFL season and the way that things have have uh, you know occurred over the last decade, where all of these new curveballs are now employed uh, almost universally with teams getting together for joint scrimmages and that being more important. In actual preseason games, you just have to adjust. Uh, and so I look for things in my, uh, on the writing aspect of it, I like narratives and I like uh, content. So I'll be making uh, a video uh, in, in the other gig that I do, uh, handicapping teams that you should back within a division as division winners that aren't the favorites. So I'll look at teams that way and I'll look into seasons that way. But I do not like projected win totals in the NFL. I like them in the NBA. I do not like them in the NFL because of how prevalent injuries are. And I mean, we will probably have a chat here August uh, 7th on August 27th uh, where one key player that means a, a ton to a specific team is done. Done before the season even starts. And that's just... Uh, the nature of the beast. So uh, I'm not a big win totals guy in, in the NFL, but obviously we, we preview uh, seasons and then we're surprised come week three as to who's 2-0. and oh, There's at least going to be two or three teams there. Uh, and I, I break the dynamic down from week to week and you look at week one is going to be, all right, who's best prepared uh, because of the fact that the preseason now, uh, the cliche is, all right, well, weeks one through three, is the actual preseason because the preseason is uh, it's discarded the way it is. Uh, but you, you get teams that are better prepared than others, uh, either from an injury standpoint or from a coaching standpoint. I'm 100% on board with uh, with you, Jim, in terms of I, I like to know the personalities of these coaches. Uh, big story today uh, in uh, on ESPN is, is how Nick Sirianni and Jalen Hurts can't really stomach one another at the moment oh, uh, boy. <laughs> and how that contributed to last season's collapse uh and you kind of can, I, i'm not a, i'm not a fan of any team which i think helps me in this regard in the you kind of look and say all right what's this bullshit or this is not this i can believe i, I do know team dynamics and how things break down and you can kind of tell them that nick Sirianni lost control of that team last year uh so we'll see how that affects this season but you look at things in terms of how how teams are like there there are some things that are done strictly for content and there are other things that actually do matter 
So how certain teams get off to starts and how that affects the rest of the season. So weeks one to three affecting the, the rest of the way absolutely matters to more teams, uh, to some teams more than others. Uh, and so you kind of try to, if you're projecting, if, you know, to steer this back to how to uh, handle different divisions. Well, I mean, you treat the margin of error for an AFC North differently than you would for an NFC South. Um, you you treat uh, the surprise factor. Like last season, I was wondering why everybody was so gung-ho about the Tampa Bay Buccaneers falling off a cliff. Well, obviously, it was because Tom Brady had retired, but nobody else is really good. So the, you, you, can, you can say from a content standpoint, uh, you know what, we're, we're not take a flyer on the Bucs because there's value in these numbers. But that you know, doesn't necessarily mean that the team's going to be any good. So I think you take that with a grain of salt. That's what I'm going to try to do in terms of uh, who, who among non-favorites do I like to potentially surprise and win a division. But as far as win totals goes, that's not my cup of tea. Tony Mejia, playbook experts with his comment on approaching the 2024 football season. And like Victor said, uh, I re rely heavily on the database as well. I know Andy's got a really, really rock solid database that he crunches numbers with as well. And doing that, uh, we use the database to put all of the stats and everything together for the playbook football preview guide magazine. So it's condensed in there for me to start the season. And inside that preview guide magazine, I'll rely heavily on the four-year statistical review. And uh, to do just that, we are going to roll into how I prepare for the season. Greg, start the clock, if you will. We're ready to rock and roll here right now. And talking about the four-year statistical review in the Playbook Preview Guide magazine, uh, I've talked before about there's everything in there that I need to know. But in this four-year statistical review, I love to find phony teams, teams that either win games inside out or lose games but won the stats. I love that because you're not reading a true score on the scoreboard. You're reading an effort that didn't transpose. But when you look at these four-year statistical reviews, for instance, you have a team like Denver uh, in the AFC West this year. Now, they slipped in the stats last year, both offensively and defensively, but they improved straight up and against the spread. That's a phony football team to me. At least their season was that way. The end of the season, they turned in their helmets. They left and they said, okay, uh, we improved. Uh, our record improved. They don't, players don't say they beat the spread, but uh, the guys in Vegas say they beat the spread. But they really didn't earn it. Uh, that's one thing that I look at. Another thing is, as Jim mentioned, the coaches, which I rely heavily on. And there was a comment was made about Jim Harbaugh. And, you know, what, I, what comes to light for me with Jim Harbaugh is the fact that in his career in the National Football League as a head coach with the San Francisco 49ers, he absolutely dominated in non-division football games. He went 34 and 13 straight up and 31, 13 and three against the spread did Harbaugh in non-division football games. And remember, the first team he took over, which was the San Francisco 49ers in the National Football League, they improved seven games from the previous year. So am I gonna look for improvement from the charges this year? You better believe it. Uh, with that also, uh, I also want to remind people, if you want to click the like button down below, send us a comment. We'll send you a free copy, a PDF version of that 2024 Playbook Football Preview Guide magazine. And with that, Andy, I'm going to roll it back to you, if we will. And let's start to kick things off with the AFC South division here. How do you see the South shipping up this year, Andy? Well, I talked a little earlier about the uh, remarkable improvement that the Houston Texans made last year with a first-year head coach and a first-year quarterback, uh, the number two pick in the draft, C.J. Stroud, and the fact that they won their home playoff game as a division winner impressively against the Cleveland Browns, who were a solid team last year. We talked about the great job they did with the five starting quarterbacks and all that. So there's a lot to be enthusiastic about. Now, I mentioned the way I look at uh, Houston, that they were a playoff team for five or six years before the, the latter part of the uh, Bill O'Brien regime. The Sean Watson situation that set the team back probably a couple of years based upon what his potential what he displayed in addition to his potential uh, before uh, he uh, lost his, uh, his, his his status in the uh, in the league for a period of time. Uh, but I also look at the rest of the vision and I try to see what the other three teams are doing. I think Jacksonville 
They started to show a little bit of a decline last year, and I'm not sure that that may not continue this year. I just don't see Jacksonville being a much better team than they were last year. I believe Tennessee continues the decline that they showed last year. They never recovered from, what was it, the 2022 season or 2021 season when they were the number one seed midway and then lost six or seven to end the season. Ultimately, uh, Vrabel lost his job uh, a couple of years later. And then I take a look at Indianapolis, which is a team that, I kind of like a little bit to challenge uh, the Texans this year, especially if Richardson, the quarterback, can stay uh, uh, can stay healthy. They've got a good running game, a decent defense, and the way that I look at the AFC South is I have Houston number one because I like their balance on both sides of the football. They've got a quarterback that they're letting play, and of course, D'Amico <laughs> Ryan's you know came came over from San Francisco. Defensive uh, uh, excellence is his trademark, so I like them to win that division. I have them as probably. Uh, about an 11 win, possibly 12 win team, but I see them as the best team. I think Indianapolis will be a playoff team. I'm not sure if it'll be with nine or 10 wins. I think Jacksonville regresses a little bit this year, although they may match what they did last year, which I think was, I think they were nine and eight, uh, if I recall correctly, maybe eight and nine. Were, but I think yes. it was nine. Yeah. And uh, I think it's a continued drop for the Tennessee Titans. Uh, They've got quarterback issues. I don't know that Levis is the uh, guy. Remember, he dropped in the draft. He was one of those hot commodities going into the final 48 hours before the draft. And he dropped uh, much more than people thought. Uh, Of course, you don't have Derrick Henry, even though at the tail end of of his career, I think Henry makes a big difference in Baltimore this year. Uh, I think it frees up uh, some of the pressure on Lamar Jackson. The Ravens will be dangerous. They play in that tough AFC North. But I think Tennessee probably ends up, haven't made the play yet, but I might look for them under their season win total because I don't see, uh, I don't see them breaking, I don't, I don't see them breaking 500 and it might be a struggle to be three and three in the AFC South. So Andy, to wrap up the AFC South, your, what I would say, your best team in the AFC South and your most disappointing team. Uh, I don't know if you could say the best team and the most disappointing team other than look at it for who I have projected to win. I think Houston being, I don't know if that's a surprise other than the, other than the extent that it might be a surprise that they can prove that what they did last year was not a fluke. So I believe that will be the case, that it was not a fluke last year, even though teams will be gunning for them this year. And I don't know that you can say Tennessee will be a disappointing team or a surprising team the other way, but I expect them to have difficulty matching what they, what they've done the last few years. So, uh, you know, when I look at it disappointing or surprising, I'll take a look at it in terms of the way in most of these divisions that I have my, um, um, that I have my division standings. Although I suppose if I were going to say uh, which team in the AFC South may have a good upside, it might be the Indianapolis Colts. There you go. That's Andy Isco looking at the AFC South. Let's keep it in Las Vegas with Jim Feist. Jim, how do you see this AFC South battle shaping up? Is there anybody inside this division that you think is a legitimate Super Bowl contender, or is it just a blase division? Well, I think I think the Texans are a legitimate Super Bowl contender because I do believe they're going to win this division. And if they stay healthy, I think D'Amico Ryan's a good coach. Defensively, he you know, he knows his stuff. They did re- really well offensively. They're playing in a very weak division, so I think they'll win this division and move on to the playoffs. Now, and you know, talking about February, January, February games, when the playoffs start, you never know what we're going to look at that, at that point. But they're legitimate, and if you get into the playoffs and you have some scoring punch and a decent coach and a decent defense, you can cause some trouble. Yes, I mean, there's not. This is a, this is a league in transition, in my opinion. There's a lot of teams with new coaches, new quarterbacks. Offensive line play has been weak over the years. It's not really gotten that much better. So a lot of things can happen. And when you have defense, when you have weak offensive line play, you have the potential of really getting your quarterback hurt. So if that happens to any of these teams, I mean, last year we I think we had over 60 starting quarterbacks in the league and, and Cleveland had five of them. So, uh, yeah, I, I think that Texans, because they will make the playoffs, they, if they can stay healthy, I think they have the quality there to do some damage. Now, can they overcome other AFC teams when they get in the playoffs? That's a whole nother question, but they they will be alive at playoff time. Jim Feist all over the Houston Texans inside that AFC South division. And Jim, 
What do you see being a disappointing team this year in the AFC South? What team do you think does not live up to standards? <laughs> Maybe all of them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, the Colts. We don't know. It, we don't know enough about the quarterback for the Colts. He didn't play very much last year. He got hurt. He could easily get hurt again. He has the style of of play that puts him at risk. We haven't had much out of Lawrence with the Jaguars. He has not lived up to expectations. He was a slam dunk, great quarterback coming out of college, but he's not done it. And the Titans are a mess right now. So I, I think all three of these other teams could be a disappointment, except let's go back to one other thing. These teams are all going to be underdogs in, in many games this year. And underdogs do cover the spread a lot. So as a spread better throughout the year and a totals better, you can make money on all of these bad teams covering when they're undervalued. Even though they're bad, they still could be undervalued. So there's money to be made along the way. But if you're talking long-term projections, I think the Colts, Jaguars, and Titans could all be disappointed. Well, they could also be money line dog winners, too, when they do win that game or two, as Jim's expecting here, especially on a money line play, as Jim likes to do frequently. I know that as well. <laughs> Victor, how do you see this uh, this division shaping up the AFC South? Well, you know, the, uh, the division title came down in the very last game of the season last year, right? Did it, wasn't it Houston who beat the Colts on the road in the final regular season game? On the very, on the very last game, yes. And they got outstatted in that game as well, yes, I believe. Did. Yes, so they, they finished, did. what, 10 and 7. Jacksonville and uh, the Colts went 9 and 8. Uh, Tennessee 6 and 11. The interesting thing about the Jaguars was, you know, we were talking on this show last year about the fact that the Jaguars had not won but two consecutive games in a row across the pond over there in England or Germany or whatever. Two in a row. And when a team plays overseas, they're allowed to choose whether they want a bye week or not that following week. They chose not to. Even with two international games in a row, they chose not to. They were on a roll. At one point, they were 8-3. and three, And we talk about at one point, it's going to catch up to them. And it did. They finished the season. They were a crappy team in December with a 1-5 and five straight up record. It caught up to them. I'm curious to see. I haven't checked my schedule yet whether maybe they've learned from that and, and take that by after that uh, uh, the, the international travel type game. I love the value with a team that's three to one odds or better to win this division. And that is the Colts, Indianapolis Colts. You're going to have that full season from that Anthony Richardson quarterback. You're going to have some revenge. You're going to have some motivation on the Colts side from that season ending loss that took them out of the playoffs. Additions at wide receiver this year in the draft. Adonai Mitchell, the great wide receiver from Texas. In fact, they drafted three wide receivers in the first five rounds of the draft. So I, odds currently right now, Houston right around Pickham plus 105. Jacksonville plus 275. Indianapolis plus 310. Tennessee plus 1,000. I like the odds at 3-1 to one on the Colts to win the division. My disappointment would, I don't know if it's going to be a disappointment, but I got to pick a team and I would pick the Houston Texans who go from hungry hunters with a rookie head coach and quarterback who overachieved one year to all of a sudden becoming that team with the unfamiliar role of being the hunted in the division. That is a team I would throw it in as a either disappointment this season or potentially not uh, eclipsing their nine and a half wins. I believe that's their over under. Give me a minute to throw out some over under numbers because we had diverse over under results last year for all four of these teams. The Colts, surprisingly, with the fact that they lost their starting quarterback in the second game of the season, were one of the NFL's best over teams last year at 11 and 6 over under again very surprising given the fact that it was Gardner Minshew at quarterback for the bulk of those games at home the Colts 7 and 2 over under 7 overs only two unders 51.1 combined points per game you can look for those numbers to go up even higher this year so that's a team where we're going to be looking to 
Uh, keep on playing Colt overs at home this season. And then you had two teams in both Houston and Tennessee who were one two of the best under teams last year. Both went 6-11 and 11 over under in the regular season. Uh, they were tied with eight other teams at 65% under the total. That's both Houston and uh, Tennessee. In fact, Tennessee was one of only four teams in the NFL to average less than 37 combined points per game when playing on the road last year, and we'll look for that to continue. But one thing that will, I think, uh, even out a little bit was Houston went 3-6 and six over under at home last year. With the addition of Stephon Diggs and Joe Mixon, you got a healthy tight end room. They drafted a good rookie in Cade Stover at tight end. I do think Houston will improve their numbers, and that's a team I'll look to play a few more overs at home than unders this season. Nice review, Victor King, the AFC South. And, Victor, when I come around after Tony, after we let Tony take the stand here, I'm going to reiterate a lot of what you just said. I'm going to tell you that right now. Tony Mejia, AFC South, where do you see it going? Tony may be muted right now. I'm only going to guess. There you are. Okay. All right. Uh, I was saying Anthony Richardson is a wild card because we really didn't get to see much from him. And uh, what we did see was absolutely dynamic. I think he can he can be an upgrade on what we expect Justin Fields to be. He's that caliber of an athlete but he disappointed at florida too um you know given that he is from gainesville he was a, a home run recruit and uh, they didn't win as many games as they probably thought they would uh with him at the helm but i mean there were there were tons of issues uh there for florida and then he, he goes higher than i think a lot of people expected him to in the draft and uh gets handed the job the the colts used the most no huddle of any team in the nfl last year when he was out there, when Minshew was out there, and now you have the insurance policy that is Joe Flacco, which, I mean, think about how Steichen is going to have to uh, maneuver if Richardson does get hurt because it's going to be a completely different offense that's still going to want to go fast. Uh, and and to, to Victor's point on playing overs with uh, the Colts, the, you know, that had a lot to do with their defense not being up to par last year. How does that improve with Gus Bradley, you know, being a, a pretty good teacher on that side of the ball, but is he going to get those results? Um, and with the fact that no huddle is the, you know, often the best friend to an offense and the worst enemy to a defense because they don't have as much time to recover if you hit a home run play and whatnot. So I'm definitely on board with Colts overs. I'm kind of on board with the Colts as a team that could very much surprise because I do think Richardson has it in him to be one of those players that's better uh, as a pro than he is in college. I don't think Houston takes a step back. I think uh, Stefan Diggs is going to be a player that with a chip on his shoulder uh, and so long as he's getting the ball and not being a prima donna is going to elevate that that team to avoid uh, a sophomore slump from Stroud. And I don't think that he has that in him either. I think he's, he's somebody that you can kind of rely on uh, not to uh, unless he gets injured not to take a step backwards. So I definitely think Houston is the rightful favorite in this division. And I definitely think Tennessee is the rightful doormat. I mean, we don't know much about Brian Callahan. We'll see what he's gonna be able to do uh, if he's going to be one of those coaches that will say, let's try to stay in games as long as possible because of our deficiencies from a roster that basically dealt all of its uh, veterans last year uh, in order to rebuild on the run and now looks to compete with a quarterback that I don't think anybody believes in other than talent-wise, yeah, Will Levis should be pretty good. Is he a poor man's Josh Allen, or can he be Josh Allen? You know, that remains to be seen because they have a similar skill set in terms of rocket arm, great athlete, uh, and poor in terms of accuracy and consistency. So the ceiling is there for Levis. We'll see what his floor is. Uh, and and then the uh, the fourth team in that division, I think, is the most interesting one. It's Jacksonville. And certainly, uh, I don't sell Doug Peterson short. We've seen what he can do with a quality football team. Uh, and I think Trevor Lawrence is going to be better this year. But we have been waiting on him uh, to make that step forward. And I think they are one of the teams that are on my list of teams that immediately have to hit the ground running because their schedule is a tough one. 
Um, and if they can survive that early slate, I think it's Miami, Buffalo, Cleveland's in there. Um, let me look at my notes here. Uh, Houston is in there. Only the meeting with the Browns is at home. Well, if they get through that, then they're in pretty good shape. And we know immediately whether we should take them seriously or not. And, and uh, from a roster standpoint, I think they'll be fine. Um, so you know, two teams to watch. You got, you got the Texans trying to tread water and schedule wise, uh, from what I remember writing, uh, I think that their schedule early is friendly. Uh, and there is a the meeting with Buffalo there that Diggs will have circled. And if they fare well in those games early on, we could be talking about them being one of the odds-on favorites to reach a Super Bowl. You know, we always see one of those teams that uh, America adopts as a Cinderella uh, from, a, from a betting odds standpoint. Like, wow, this team started at 7-1 and one and whatnot. Uh, and then Indianapolis need to see how Richardson fares. Jacksonville need to see how they get through those early stages. And uh, Tennessee, whether they can pick off a win or not, um, you know, right out of the gate, Tennessee plays uh, uh, Chicago. So that'll obviously be Caleb Williams' debut. Uh, if he come out of the gate, it's at home. Uh, everybody will be uh, <laughs> ready to coordinate him. And uh, then Tennessee has to face the Jets and Green Bay and Miami, and they could be headed to a start and a season or whatnot. So, but by the yeah, way, We'll look at them early on uh, in terms of uh, this division from month to month because there really isn't um, a heavy favorite outside of Houston, but it's a, a heavy favorite that even if they start off seven and one, they're going to need to prove it back into the schedule uh, based on what we've seen from them uh, as a as a you know what have you come uh, what have you done for me lately type of team uh, you know that hasn't really proven much, but they have a young talent to get the job done. Mark, I was going to ask you, I didn't mean to interrupt there, but while well, the question comes to mind, since Tony brought it up, do you, uh, does your I think your database might have this information. Rookie quarterbacks, say, in their first game, starting at home against an experienced quarterback on the other side and first game on the road, uh, first game of the season on the road, starting against an, an, uh, an experienced quarterback on the other side. Well, I do not have rookie quarterbacks in our database, and uh, – it would also be against experienced teams. The experienced teams would also be a little bit uh, arbitrary because we have to. I, what's an what's an experienced team? Uh, you know, is it uh, the coach, the players? Who knows? We're not talking about a starting, it, yeah. starting right. quarterback on the other team ha is an experienced quarterback. He's been a starter for a year or two. Not All I know for sure, Andy, is that rookie quarterbacks making their first start in the NFL are absolutely tragic. Yeah, uh, absolutely tragic. Uh, I had those numbers before in the past. I don't want to throw them. I want to say like two and sixteen, but I'll bring them up next show. We we talk about in making that first we start. We were one of those situations this year with some of the rookies starting right out of the gate. Yeah, and we will see them exactly. But for, for example, sure. I yep. think in Tennessee with Caleb Williams going up against uh, Levis. Right. See, I don't. I don't think consider Levis a. Uh, an no. experienced quarterback, so it wouldn't apply in that situation, right. even if he may. I don't remember if he had a start or two last year or not, but uh, there will be other situations with probably ooh, could be, half, you know, three to five rookies starting as quarterback. Hey, with that, guys, I'm going to uh, turn this over to Victor King, uh, not to Victor King, but I want to mention Victor King's totals tip sheet. If uh, anybody hasn't seen it, you have to get a copy of Victor's totals tip sheet. This is, is like a money making machine each and every year. All it does is win, guys. You can go on the online at playbooksports.com, pick up a copy of the totals tip sheet uh, in time for the first week of the football season. And there's also a dynamic dual special effort offer up there, combination of the totals tip sheet and the playbook newsletter in a two for one money saving combo. You can check that out at playbooksports.com. Greg De Palma, our producer, I would love to know what you think about this particular division this year. Well, uh, since we're really behind on our uh, on our time, I'll try to go really quick and uh, just kind of reiterate a few of the points that you guys made already anyway. And uh, and, and you know what? I'm actually getting a little love uh, to Jacksonville uh, as the team that will uh, possibly surprise and beat out Houston. Uh, you know, you, you talked about Houston potentially, uh, and Victor pointed out, of course, that they're going to be the hunted. I do believe that that is going to have an impact. A lot easier when you're a team nobody's really taken uh, seriously, and now everybody's gunning for you. So I think that's going to come into play. And I also think Jacksonville is just – I just think they're a lot better than 
uh, I think they're getting credit for. I mean, Doug Peterson, I mean, last year they were 9-8. and eight. I think a lot of people are looking at them thinking, oh, they had a bad year, like they had a six-win team or something like that. You know, they lost their playoff opportunity on the last week of the season. Uh, Trevor Lawrence uh, had an injury last year. That definitely had a lot, of, uh, a lot uh, to uh, impact his overall game. He still is an excellent downfield uh, passer, even though there's no question he's got to cut the turnovers out. But uh, they've added now uh, Davis in free agency, Brian Thomas in the draft. you got Etienne in the backfield. You've got Ingram at tight end. They added Mitch Morris at center. Their offense is going to be, uh, I think, more explosive than we've seen it before if Trevor Lawrence just kind of plays as good as he's capable of playing. We don't need him to be a superstar. Just need him to play, you know, top 10 quarterback football or even top 15. And I think they're going to do well, especially on defense, because that defensive front is really going to be scary when you take a look at them adding Eric Armstead along with Trevon Walker who's going to turn in he's already starting to turn into a superstar and you have Josh Allen that is uh, that's a hell of a front uh those three guys are just really really uh dangerous uh and then overall I think they've added a few guys and over the last couple of drafts too in the back seven so I think they're going to be really dangerous so I'm going to take Jacksonville over Houston uh, and everybody's alright as far as Indianapolis. We have no idea what to expect from Richardson. Problem is, they just don't have enough on defense. So I think they're going to be a very exciting team to watch. I think they're going to be in a lot of high-scoring games, and I think there's going to be a team that, uh, as long as Richardson's playing, you're going to want to tune in and, and watch them play. And Tennessee might end up as the worst team in the NFL. Uh, they're going to go from a veteran football coach to a rookie head coach uh, there's just a lot of youth on that coaching staff. There's a lot of youth on that team in general. Uh, general managers, pretty inexperienced all across the board. This is a major rebuilding job in Tennessee, and it's going to be a very long season. So Jacksonville up, uh, Tennessee way down. Tough times for Tennessee. Up news for Jacksonville. Uh, before I'm going to, as I do my two teams that I think are worthy, you know, or they watch this year, I'm going to reverse the order here and I'm going to uh, lay out my most disappointing team in the AFC South this year first. And I'm going to go right to the most popular team inside the division, the Houston Texans. Uh, and this goes to a lot what we talked about returning to the norm. Uh, it goes to, you know, Greg uh, does a great horse race handicapping show, and one of the big theories is bouncing in horse races where horses run their best race, and they make it very, very difficult to come back the next race after running a career high. Well, it's safe to say that every player on the Houston Texans had a career best year last football season. And the key for me is this, is that they won as many games last year, those 11 wins, was as many as they won in their previous three years combined. That's a big quantum leap for a football team to have to take and make and then have to play up to that same level next year. And I think it was Victor who said, you know, they were the hunter last year. They're going to be the hunted this year. We'll see whether or not they can play up to that same level here. I think it's a disappointment uh, for the Houston Texans this football season. As far as a team that I like inside this division, I'm going to take a look at, long look at the Indianapolis Colts. Uh, I consider Jacksonville, but that bad taste in my mouth when I look at uh, Trevor Lawrence's uh, 7.1 passing yards per attempt. Until that gets any better, I, I got to let Jacksonville go here. But as Victor mentioned, that bad taste they had in their mouth last year, if that one and five finish, I think that really sets the table for this football team here this year. And remember, the Colts have dominated Houston in the past. They're 33 and 11 and, and straight up on the scoreboard against who's supposedly going to be the best team in the division. Here's the key. Victor also called this out. You take a look at this football team here. They're going to have major revenge in that first game of the season because it was indeed Houston who cost them the playoffs last year. You take a look at the Colts record. The last 16 years in season opening games, they've won once. One, one in 15. Wow. So what I'm saying here, guys, is if they can overcome that hurdle, that may just well be a buy sign for the Indianapolis Colts because this football team is going to be really focused. And if they can get over that 1-15 and mark in the first game of the football season here, they'll be on their way to winning the AFC South. You're tuned in to Mark Lawrence against the spread, the nation's most popular sports handicapping talk show. And with that, Greg, I'm going to ask you to start the clock, even though we avoided it last segment here, but start the clock, if you will, and we're going to talk about the AFC West division 
Jim Feist, how do you see things shaping up out your way in the AFC West this year? I, I don't have Jim. I don't have you on, so I can hear him. We can hear him. I can hear him fine. Yep. I can hear him fine. Okay, yeah, his levels aren't on here, so okay. I hope he's on. Go ahead. Okay. Chiefs and Raiders for Jim Feist. Chiefs to win it, Raiders at the bottom. A lot of what we saw last year that way. Victor King, how do you see the AFC West shaping up this season? Let me see here, guys. Uh, 11 and 6, and then three teams uh, under 500 last year. Chiefs 11 and 6, uh, Las Vegas 8 and 9, Denver 8 and 9, LA Chargers bringing up the rear at 5 and 12. Obviously, people know 8 division titles in a row for the Chiefs. What concerns me is that this division um, has gone down in terms of overall collective strength. In just two years, the AFC West division has turned from one of the toughest in the NFL to basically one of the uh, easiest in the NFL. Uh and I've got to pick the Chiefs as a division. I mean, if you don't pick the Chiefs as a division winner, uh, what, minus 250, everybody else is uh, plus uh, 900 or higher to win the division. What surprised me about the Chiefs last year was the fact that they won the Super Bowl in a year in which their offensive scoring went down by almost seven points per game. Yes, it did. Uh, and this is my little over-under bent, if you will. Two seasons ago... Kansas City games averaged 50.5 combined points per game. Last year, only 39.2. Kansas City Chiefs went down almost 12 points per game overall. That's deficiencies on the offensive end and, of course, the fact that they had one of the best defenses in the NFL last season. For that reason, they were the tied for the number one under team in the NFL last season, five and twelve over under, including one and seven over under at home. Only one game went over the total in Kansas City home contests last season. Only thirty nine point seven combined points per game, even less points per game when they played on the road. Thirty eight point six. You have to think with the some of the additions on offense in the off season. That big signing of Hollywood Brown, Xavier Worthy, first round wide receiver from the University of Texas, that those Kansas City numbers should go back up close to the 28 to 30 points per game range that they averaged back in the 2022, 2021, and even the COVID 2020 season. So you got to think that the Chiefs are going to have a few more overs than they did last season when they went 5-12. and 12. Another team that went 5-12 and 12 and was tied number one in terms of unders was the L.A. Chargers, tied with the Chiefs and the Carolina Panthers for best under team in the league last season. 
Uh, three and six over under at home for the Chargers. Two and six over under on the road. Um, in in terms of uh, winners, I've got you there with the Chiefs right now. But I think that it's going to be a long year for the Chargers. I'm encouraged by the coaching hire, obviously. Some of the guys here in the podcast are as well. But what concerns me about the Chargers is the fact that they got a weak wide receiver room. They got a weak running back room. They got a weak tight end room. And they now have a quarterback who will not be 100% when we start the season in Justin Herbert. So I think that they're going to eventually turn into my AFC West disappointing team like they did last year. Victor King, disappointing team this year on the L.A. Chargers, Kansas City Chiefs, another team to watch again this year as they are each and every year. Tony Mejia, how do you see the West shaking out this year? Well, I think obviously the Chiefs are the team to beat, and we will see if they're ready to play right out of the gate because they have to be. I mean, it's uh, it's Baltimore and Cincinnati immediately before you – I mean, granted, they're home games, but it, before you play, you go on the road. If you win both of those games, everybody in the AFC West might as well call it a season as far as winning the division goes. And then if you lose those games, all of a sudden it opens up, but who does it open it up to? Because you've got Denver – uh, breaking in a new quarterback, regardless of who it's going to be. Uh, and, and then you've got Oakland, who on paper, they're a, a coaching dis- mismatch because of the pedigree of the head coaches in this division, not named Antonio Pierce. Uh, you've got guys that have done it on this level for as proven winners for a very long time. Obviously, Harbaugh stepped away and then came back. But, uh, you know, they all have very long resumes of success. And Pierce is trying to get it done. Uh, but he may have the team to get it done specifically early because they play the Chargers right out of the gate. That's another immediate you know, game circled on the schedule for week one because they can really generate momentum in a positive fashion uh, if that defense is up to par. And I think one thing that went under the radar last year is Patrick Graham did a really nice job with that defense. Uh, you know, they won three out of their last four games. They were able to beat Kansas City in that, uh, what was it, a, a Black Friday game after Christmas game, I forget. It's a holiday game that they stole. Um, might have even been Christmas Day. Uh, but the bottom line is, is that they really did a nice job on the defensive end, and they they had Aiden O'Connell playing quarterback. And I'm not a huge Aiden O'Connell fan. I wasn't big on him at Purdue, and uh, we'll see how he fares now with a full training camp under his belt, being the guy. Uh, they got Luke Getzey now run, uh, running that offense, so brand new there. You've got the Devontae Adams whispers kind of haunting this team. So we'll see whether he wants to be there. I think he'll definitely be productive as long as he is there, but they need to win to keep him happy. So Raiders are one of those teams that immediately you look to and say, you got to produce now because the window is there for them to be the second best team in this division, um, both from a personnel standpoint and from a sense of urgency thing, because uh, the other two head coaches, I mean, Peyton has a, 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 very long, uh, you know, leash as far as trying to develop a new quarterback, whether it's uh, Sam Darnold or it's a rookie. And uh, and then obviously Harbaugh is putting his plan in place. So Kansas City is the hunted and will be. And even if they start off going to who's going to expect any other team that, than them to be the AFC West champ, uh, nobody's going to say that after two weeks. So uh the the raiders though have a chance to be that team that actually pushes them so i'm curious to see whether they do that there uh, from a you know who's going to win the division is going to be a disappointment i would say it's going to be uh the chiefs winning the division we'll see what where their record is uh and uh, the disappointment out of these four i mean look i i think we need to see exactly what this chargers wide receiver room looks like um, before I'm ready to make a determination that they're going to be the bottom squad out of these four. So from that standpoint, I'll give Harbaugh and those receivers the benefit of the doubt and say Denver will bring up the roof. Well, we know one thing for sure. Tony Mejia on the Kansas City Chiefs, who appear to be a consensus favorite to win the division this year. Greg De Palma, how do you see the West coming up this year, football season? Uh, with Kansas City not winning the division, uh, I, this is to me just going to be one of those situations that we've talked about before with uh, losing Super Bowl teams. 
And I just think Kansas City, this is just all going to be about, I, I, just, I can't see everything working out for them again. I just can't. It's just uh, injuries are going to, at some point, catch up to them. It catches up to everybody. Um, I also am completely and absolutely disgusted by the fact that Rasheed Rice has not been suspended yet. Um, I think that's going to be a distraction. Um, I, I, I really don't even think that the average NFL fan has any idea what Rasheed Rice did um, because it happened in April. Um, they were probably just, you know, most, you know, outside of Kansas City and Dallas, uh, most fans just had no idea this probably even happened. Bring us up to speed there, Greg, if you will. So he was driving his Lamborghini, I believe it was, uh, about 119 miles an hour, and he had another car, a rental car, another speed car, um, and I believe it was the uh, kid that was suspended from SMU. Was, uh, I guess it was an old friend of his because he went to SMU, and they wound up getting into a big accident. Uh, seven, uh, seven people were injured in the accident. Uh, they left the scene. They, they walked out of the car and left the scene. And uh, and I think they left the scene because uh, it, it appears that there was pot in, in, in the car. So they were probably stoned. And they knew that if they would have gotten tested, they would have been in big trouble. So they just left. They completely bolted. Um, there was even a mother with kids that they just didn't even care to check on. Uh now, they're in a situation where now the, the SMU suspended their player. Of course they did. Uh, but Kansas City is basically waiting for the, 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 the NFL, of course. They're not going to do anything, even though I think they should. I mean, the fact that Kansas City is sitting back and just leaving it to the NFL, that's gutless. Complete, that's just gutless. Just suspend. You have all the right in the world to suspend a kid. And if the union wants to get involved, then have a battle with the union because it would be a PR nightmare. For the for the for the for the union, if they were to back Rasheed Rice in the situation, so right now the NFL is going to end up uh, deciding what to do because the case is going to be in late Jan. Uh, I think it, it might be in uh, late December, early December. So what they're saying is, is the NFL is going to wait and see what happens, which means that chances are he's not going to get suspended this year. And then one of the ESPNs, I think it was uh, Chris Fowler, said, well, if they go by the what we've seen before, like Alvin Kamara, if they use that as an example, they'll probably just suspend him in 2025 for the first three games of the season. Now, maybe that happens. But how this kid is not suspended for the entire year, I, I just, I don't care what. We, they needed people to die in the accident for him to be suspended for the year? For the year, yeah, nobody died. That's that, that's exactly what I was going to say to you. Yeah. If somebody had died, they'd get a year of suspension. So, I mean, like, come nobody on. Did, he, I'd, be, I'd be stunned if he gets more than three years. Yeah. And, and, uh... <laughs> I mean, uh... hey. I, I do not want to come off as saying that this should be brushed under the rug or anything like that. I'm just saying that this is Rushy Rice and not Patrick Mahomes. I mean, if Rushy Rice yeah, misses three or the five games, then they'll find a way to replace him. They still have Travis Kelsey. They just brought on Worthy. They just brought on Hollywood Brown. They'll be okay. Rice got mad in the Super Bowl. That he wasn't getting the football. But I think he needs to uh, take a step backwards and, and take personal inventory. Because not only that, he was in, involved in something else. So he needs to grow up. Uh, there's no question about that. But I, I mean, the the I would buy more that the Chiefs' defense falls off as their the reason why that they you know, struggle and are reach the midseason point, still battling one of these other teams. Because this this isn't the AFC North. This is an AFC West team yeah. where we're looking to see who that number two team. Yeah, that's the thing that if they were in a, a North or even an AFC East with those top three teams, it would be much harder uh, and easier, I should say, to to say, hey, well, you know, yeah, I don't think they'll win the division. But, yeah, that division is definitely a little bit weak. By the way, one of the other things that I was a little bit annoyed at was the fact that they were asking, they were talking to Rice about the whole situation. And, uh, you know, what he wanted to uh, talk about was – uh, you know, mentioning how the, I think the exact quote was, I feel like our chemistry is going to continue to grow. I feel like it's been growing throughout the off season, blah, blah, blah. 
uh, and then they ask him, you know, to try to say something about what happened. Well, it's a legal process and my team is handling that. So it's like, dude, you know, just shut up. All right. Don't, don't talk about the NF. Don't talk about your team chemistry and football when you basically almost killed seven people. I mean, just be humble and shut your mouth. Just say, don't talk about anything because you sound like an idiot when you because just imagine if you're one of the one of those uh, family members that was involved in the accident and this guy's talking about football. It's just, I mean, that, that's why he needs to grow up. And the only way that you grow up, as we know, is you, pan, is you punish these kids. So um, we'll see what happens. But I think we all agree he's not going to get punished severely enough. Um, and then the other thing, and then I think you're right, Tony, because if you take a look at it, you know, Legereus Need is a really tough guy to replace in the secondary. And so that's going to be something that they're going to have to uh, overcome. We'll see whether or not they could do that. But again, to me, I just think it's a karma thing. It's an injury thing. It's like sooner or later, all the chips fall down. It always does. Uh, I don't say I'm not saying they're not going to make the playoffs, but I do think that the Chargers have. Uh, look, we've talked about the Chargers the last few years, and the only reason why we've all shrugged our heads about the Chargers not making the postseason is coaching. That's it. They finally now have the coach. So why would we think that they're not going to take that next step? when the coach is there to actually change everything. So I think the Chargers, I don't think there's any question. No, Herbert needs to stay healthy, like you guys said, but uh, I'm not going to say that he won't. So I like the Chargers. I'm going to say the Chargers finally uh, get it done because they have a coach. So Chargers, Chiefs, uh, I agree with you guys about the Denver Broncos and the Las Vegas because we don't know exactly how they're going to be able to compete with those quarterbacks. Maybe they will. But, you know, at this point, we really would just be guessing. Greg DePalma with a bad taste in his mouth about the rice situation at Kansas City, and rightfully so, I should, I might add. Andy Isco, we're talking about the AFC West. What do you have to say about the West, Andy? I, I'm sort of along the lines with, with Greg, and both you and Jim talked about it, coaching, the importance of it. But not only do you go to Jim Harbaugh, who I think, and I think you said it, Mark, earlier, improved the 49ers uh, by seven games in his first year. Uh, but you go to him from one of the worst coaches in NFL, uh, I won't say NFL history, but let's say in the uh, in the last time, 20 yeah. years. Right. Yeah, the modern, the relatively modern era. And you know, they lost a number of close games last year that very easily could have been turned into wins. And I think their draft choice of Joe Alt will help a lot, overcome some of the deficiencies that they've suffered at running back and at uh, uh, at receiver, so I think that that was a wise draft move, and I think that's going to give make Herbert a better quarterback and increases chances of staying healthy uh, with uh, uh, with what all lends to that uh, offensive line. Uh, I still think Kansas City wins the division because they can't have uh, the kind of offensive decline that they showed last year, where they dropped off by what nearly a touchdown. Uh, per game offensively, despite I think it was five points per game improvement defensively. Uh, so I think the defense will still be solid, may not be at the level of last year, but may not have to be because I, I think that the offense, whatever decline we see by the defense may be more than overcome by the improvement we see from the offense. So I still have Kansas City as the team to beat. And I certainly would think that if there's going to be a surprise team in this division that can upset Kansas City, I certainly think it's the Chargers because, as Greg pointed out, this was a team that we've been saying has been a good team for the last few years based largely on the roster that they had, the development of Herbert at quarterback and the surrounding talent that they put around him. Now, some of that talent, of course, is gone, but now you're substituting a weak coach, uh, well, an outstanding coach for a weak coach who will be able to overcome some of those deficiencies because of his track record, what he's done in the past. I mean, let's not forget what he did in San Francisco, but also remember what Jim Harbaugh did at the college level before getting that San Francisco job when, you know, first at the University of San Diego, turned around that program, uh, turned around Stanford when he was there. So he's 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 been a winner everywhere he's been in college and pro football. No reason to think he can't do that with the talent that he's given. And a lot of it has to do also with the balance of the division. I think that, you know, I, I don't know that Kansas City wins in a runaway, but I can certainly see both Kansas City and the Chargers getting double-digit wins. I think the Chargers are good at least for a 10-7 and seven record. As I think I mentioned before, I played them over their total of, uh, of nine uh, earlier this, uh, uh, well, this summer. Um, but I think there will be a gap between those two teams and the Raiders and the uh, Broncos. And I think 
significant uh, quarterback is, is a significant uh, question mark on Denver. We don't know how good uh, the Raiders are. The positive on the Raiders is they really welcomed the coaching change in midseason last year. They did not like Josh McDaniels. They really didn't play for him. Antonio Pierce comes in, and you could see the energy level of that team. You could see the performance uh, of level of that team uh, really turn things on, especially defensively with Max Crosby and some other really good talent on that team. Uh, what has me... Uh, uh, I think they may be disappointing because I don't know that they can go eight and nine this year because it's a very tough schedule that the Raiders have to play. On the other hand, they own the Denver Broncos. What if they won like 10 out of 11 or 11 out of 12 straight against the Broncos? And that was when the Broncos were a decent team uh, before uh, uh, the last couple of years. And the Raiders were pretty average. Well, the Raiders did have one decent, one or two decent seasons in there. So for that reason, uh, unless uh, the Broncos are able to sweep the Raiders this year in this series and do something they haven't done probably since Peyton Manning was quarterback, uh, I will pick the uh, Raiders uh, in third and the uh, Broncos uh, to, to finish last with a significant, I'd say maybe at least a three, possibly a four game drop off from my second place choice Chargers and the third place choice Raiders. As far as who will be more disappointing between the Raiders and the Broncos, I will say the Broncos simply because Sean Payton has a lot of issues to deal with. Uh, Russell Wilson did not work out as he hoped and of course Payton's known for uh, being a quarterback's coach. We saw what he did. He took uh, Drew Brees to the Hall of Fame. Uh, uh, with that, uh, if the Raiders and, and I don't mind Gardner Minshew as a decent backup. Remember the Colts you talked about last. You know, uh, Tony talked about they were nine and eight last year uh, with uh, a backup quarterback. So uh, Minshew, I think, provides protection. Don't know that I necessarily would have paid it much for him as the Raiders did, but I think that uh, that would make Denver to me a more disappointing team simply because they're resetting back to zero. Denver Broncos disappointing team in the division for Andy. He sees the Chargers challenging the Chiefs for the top spot inside that division. I'm going to go first to my most disappointing team in the division, and I'm going to make it a three-pack about the Kansas City Chiefs being disappointing this football season here. I love I love the return to the norm aspect in every facet of sports. The Kansas City Chiefs, they've got a bullseye on their back, the size nobody's ever seen in the National Football League. Victor, you know this. You can, you can uh, you confirm this. Andy Reid's the cover boy on the Playbook magazine this year. That's been an absolute kiss of death. Just ask Joe Paterno <laughs> the year after he graced the cover of the magazine. Uh, you know, all that kidding aside. But the Chiefs would have to be the first team in almost 100 years to win this, to win the Super Bowl three years in a row. It's just not going to happen, folks. Uh, and also, interestingly, the Chiefs are going to play on six different days of the week this year. They're the first team in the National Football League to ever do that. Six different days of the week. I guess you can bring the biorhythm gods in here and ask what the effect it's going to have on Kansas City, but having their game spaced in over six different days of the week, I don't think it helps. Every, every day but Tuesday, I believe. I think right. it is. Every day but Tuesday, exactly. Uh, and, I, and the other point I'm going to bring up here is what Victor mentioned here. It's a case of serious shrinkage. And here's a football team last year that was negative 52 net yards on offense. Victor mentions they were minus seven points per game on offense last year. Patrick Mahomes went 11 and six during the regular season last year. It was his worst performance, his worst record since he became the quarterback QB one in 2018. And I'm going to wrap that all up with uh, a TT MTS too much Taylor Swift for this football team. <laughs> We saw an awful lot of it last year. If we see more of it this year, it'll be, oh, God. Uh, and I think they could lose their focus here. But I, I, see, I see the return to the norm here for Kansas City this particular football season. Three in a row, I say no way, Jose. The team I've got being the surprise team here is much like Greg De Palma, our producer, mentioned here. Uh, also, Andy Isco mentions the L.A. Chargers. I think this is going to be the surprise team inside this division this year. Uh, remember, this team suffered from a bad case of Brandon Staley last season here. Uh, <laughs> now, this is Jim Harbaugh coming in here, where he's met with exceptional success everywhere that he's been. Uh, you're taking a look at a team that I mentioned has improved uh, that San Francisco 49er team by seven games. They're going to play four teams this season against teams that actually owned a winning record last year. That's not a not a difficult schedule. Look at their schedule here, guys, and look at the win-loss percentage of their opponents here. Only four of them had winning records last football season here. 
And you're talking about Justin Herbert, who Joe Alt was a great call out. The fact that he was drafted, I think he'll end up being the rookie of the year, possibly in the National Football League. And if he is, it will be because he kept Justin Herbert upright. And Justin Herbert, as he stays upright, has the potential to win the MVP this year. So put me down for the L.A. Chargers, a big value play to steal the division this year. And that's going to put the final wraps in this edition of Mark Lawrence against the spread. Great show, guys. A lot of great information passed back and forth. I want to thank our cast of experts on the show this week. And until next week, once again, this is Mark Lawrence reminding you to always to remember to bet with your head, not over it. And good luck as always.